Welcome back, everyone. We're here for another show. We have some really good uh, people standing by. Thing that I say is not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. In fact, um, if you um, you know hear something that uh, could help you, um, check with your doctor before taking any recommendations. With that said, folks in what we call the green room, getting to know people all over the world. We've got Poland and uh, your old haunt, uh, Vancouver and Canada and so on. And maybe without further ado, uh, Jessica and I have been talking about food, which is uh, exuberant with as we used to be because of your great recommendations, Doc. And Jessica, you're on with Dr. Berg. Unmute yourself. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Jessica. I'm sorry, am I supposed to? Yeah, why, don't you, uh, why don't you just ask a question? How about that? Okay, should okay. Uh, my question there was that I started doing keto uh, three, and intermittent fasting three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I started with two meals a day. Fast. Mm -hmm. So my last meal was around 8 o'clock at night and lunch around noon. And then no snacks whatsoever. Uh, no bread, no anything, and another meal around seven or so, or eight. So my question was, or my observations, well, like in three or four days, my carb stopped. Um, you know, I was a chocolate junkie and all that, but it just stopped. It, it, it was incredible. However, uh, I did this because... I know you say, don't do it because you want to lose weight, but that's what I want to do around my abdomen. And then like three months later, I could not fit into my jeans. Mm -hmm. So all the weight went there and I tried everything. I tried exercising. I tried intermittent fasting without eating whatever I wanted. So nothing worked till I came across your videos and I said, okay, I'll do keto and intermittent, intermittent fasting. And my, you know, uh, Cravings went away. However, I have not lost any weight, like maybe one kilogram in three weeks. And I cannot seem to fast over 16 hours because uh, where I'm, I'm at, I'm in Argentina, it's 12.05 now. So I'm getting hungry. So it makes it difficult to fast over 16 hours because I start getting hungry and hungry and I'm starting to get a headache. And I, my work, I'm a psychiatrist, but my work, is, I do a lot of non-clinical work. So I need a lot of focus and attention and I start to, you know, not pay attention and I just have to get up and eat. So I wanted to go into a longer fast, 18 hours or even do OMAD and I can't. And it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because the weight's not coming off. My jeans still don't fit. I mean, it, it's, it's so I, I'm... I'm just wearing sweatpants. Um, right. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Berg. Let's uh, see what you have to say. Well, let's, let me give you some advice, Jessica. Um, as you work with patients, you know um, you have a waiting room. You have, you have, you're a patient. You have to be a patient. Now you're on the other side. You're having to have patients. Unfortunately, with something like this, um, I would focus on the, the principle that I came up with uh, several years ago that it's not lose weight to get healthy. It's get healthy to lose weight first. So it's this health thing, right? We're focusing on first, but of course we want to lose weight. Um, the problem is the estimation of effort to get you healthy is usually a lot longer than you might think or expect. Um, the fact that your cravings are going away tells me that your body's starting to shift over to ketones. So it's working. Uh, that's good. Um, how do we speed it up? Well, you're trying. You're actually trying to do OMAD. Great. Um, I would increase the amount of fat at the meal so you can go longer um, so you're not satisfied and the fact that you're hungry and it's it just tells us that you have insulin resistance and it's going to take longer um, there's various things that you can do to speed things up of course um, one of the biggest things is start dropping your carbs down you know i mean yeah you want to fast but try to bring your carbs down even more increase more fat, maybe a little more protein, more vegetable. And then, then you have the sleep variable, you have the stress variable, that is another factor. Um, you have the exercise. And all those factors you're juggling now and you're trying to, to make it work. But um, I've noticed with certain people uh, that their metabolism is slow, 
they have to um, unfortunately give it one to two to three months to really start seeing the weight loss. I had a, I had one gal who um, lost no weight the first month, um, very depressed, upset, but she had all these other great things health wise. And the second month, I think she lost um, a little bit of weight. And the third month, that's when she started losing a lot of weight. And I, I wrote that in my book. So it's one of those things that if you have insulin resistance, um, it could take a month to two to three months. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I don't want to, um, I want to give you the right estimation so you're not feeling that it's not working. Um, so it is working. It's just, unfortunately, it's you're up against years of, maybe dieting or trying this, and also uh, the carbs. Um, I would, and this might be hard, try to gauge um, your results f- at least for the next month on the size of your clothes. Your clothes should start feeling looser, especially in the midsection. You should start seeing more energy. You, you, your mood should be improving. Your ability to go longer without eating is another indicator that it's working. And focus on those. And then the weight will come off. I promise you. I'll give you that in writing. <laughs> All right. Try those things. And thanks for uh, those, that great question because it's it's common. And uh, Thank you. unfortunately, it does take quite a bit of time. Well, that's fantastic. Well, we're rooting for you, Jessica. And... Uh... You know, all that great food uh, down there in Argentina, I know that must be uh, really quite tempting as it is all over the world with the great stuff uh, that everyone has to eat in their various countries. And uh, I tell you what, Dr. Berg, why don't we kick things off with our first quiz question? All right. So when women get pregnant, a lot of times they have uh, nauseousness, nausea. Um, That indicates a very specific nutrient deficiency. So what nutrient deficiency is related to nausea during pregnancy? That's the first question. Okay, well, uh, uh, audience, dig into that. And why don't we go uh, to the uh, ever-patient Chase, who is in Illinois. Chase, unmute yourself and get ready for your big debut on the Dr. Berg Show. Go ahead, Chase, with your question for Dr. Berg. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi, how are Uh, you? My question is what you would recommend for someone like me who's not doing keto for weight loss really, but a lot of the health benefits. And I've really struggled with just losing weight while doing any type of intermittent fasting. So I kind of- Maybe you need to give that problem to Jessica and you can take her problem and switch it. It seems to be- uh, Sure, I'm sure a lot of people are are loving how I presented that, but um, I'm just, I I mean, I'm dropping weight like crazy. I've had to kind of stop intermittent fasting altogether. how, How old are you? 36. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a similar thing. It's like if I, if I go, if I fast too long, all of a sudden I lose too much weight. So I think the, the most important thing right now is to um, um, increase the fat in your diet because that way at least your body won't go after your own fat. You do not want to go low fat. So this means trying to consume as much fat as you can without feeling, you know, that you can't digest it. You're getting bloating. So like MCT oil. Um, like sure. Um, make sure that you have maybe some coconut oil, uh, even even between the meals. Um, I definitely would do two meals a day. I wouldn't do three, of course, no snacks. And then you're going to have to increase the calories that you're eating. Um, so it's calories and more fat right now. And then also weight training with exercise to keep your muscle stimulated, to keep more bulk. Uh, that's another factor. But I do understand um, the other thing you can do is keep your carbs, specifically maybe berries, right around, and all your other carbs, maybe right around 50 grams. Not more than that, but on the high end. And those are the things that um, I would do if I were you, just to keep things um, from getting too lean, you know, to get some of the benefits. But as you get older, and uh, it'll be a little easier for you to do because so, you won't be losing as much weight. But the benefits um, and are huge, cognitive-wise, mood-wise, health-wise, inflammation-wise. So that's just, uh, you'll have to kind of uh, juggle those factors. Sure. And then what's your opinion on like cycling off or is keto something you recommend, you know, just continually doing for the rest of your life? Yeah, because uh, this whole carb cycling thing is, is it's false information. Like our, there's no benefit to carb load or carb up. There's not any benefit with that. It's like 
what you're doing is you're just basically dumping, you're making, you're stimulating more insulin, and um, our bodies weren't even designed to to to, stim- to do that. So, like some people think you're going to reset the body. There's no data. I, I've looked extensively that says that you need to carb cycle. Um, I think it just kind of what that will do. That will mimic dieting, and it slows the metabolism down over time. And just because you're going to create more insulin resistance. Um, our bodies were not designed to have this many carbohydrates. So, yeah, I think it's a, a bit of a myth. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Boy, can I relate to uh, to Chase. I'll tell you what, my bikini's just falling right off of me. I can't seem to keep any weight on, Doc. It's just an awful problem. But anyway, why don't we go and talk about who in the world is watching? So we got viewers from the UK, Canada, Australia, Jordan, Kuwait, Iraq, Malaysia, France, Algeria, Chile, India, Saudi Arabia, Japan, the Netherlands, Taiwan, Romania, Mexico, South Africa, Germany, Morocco, Libya, Italy, Poland, Pakistan, Israel. Hang on. And uh, boy, all uh, it's just incredible. Spain, Belgium, the Philippines, Romania, Turkey, and all across these United States. So thank you folks so much. And we have uh, another person who comes from, uh, actually, I guess, Cambodia originally, but she is in, or she's Cambodian, but she is in uh, Toronto. You're all haunt. And Da, you're on with Dr. Berg. Make sure you're unmuted. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. Um, So I've been fasting now for about two years. Um, Been playing around with the... um, doing a lot of intermittent fasting as well as um, like long fasting, 10 days is my max. Um, and I'm achieving really amazing results, but I've noticed that I've lost a lot of hair. Um, and so recently I'm trying to get down another five pounds. So I've done um, 72 and 48. So every other day eating and I'm noticing a lot more hair loss. Is there anything that I can do to help prevent it or kind of like stop it altogether? Or um, I, I really don't know what's going on with okay. the hair. Do you have any other symptoms like fatigue, weakness? So I did notice some fatigue um, and I've been kind of supplementing with some electrolytes, which have made me feel like so much better. But, um, and I did get a blood test done with my doctor. Um, the results, uh, she said it's good. So um, like, I'm not really getting any answers to what I could do to help with it. I think I, we know based on what you said, there's some, some type of nutrient deficiency. Um, mm-hmm. So the most likely deficiency is gonna be either the trace minerals or uh, the B vitamins. And there's a whole number of reasons um, that can indicate you you maybe need more than usual. Um, so when you're doing fasting, I always recommend because we don't know we don't know how deficient you are even going into this. So um, when you do fasting, especially 72 hours to 48 hours, you're tapping into your reserves. So you may just be tapping into a bucket that's empty, and then it shows up in your hair. The hair loss is a really good indicator of knowing that you're deficient in certain nutrients. So trace minerals is one, and then the other one is the B vitamins. But of course, you don't want to take a synthetic B. You want a natural B complex um, that's mm-hmm. hard to find. Nutritional yeast is a good thing. Um, that's that's the two things. Now, um, I highly doubt if it's a protein deficiency. Um, sometimes if it's cyclic, it could be female hormone hormonal issues. Um, but there are several very important nutrients that involve, I mean, that, uh, support the hair. Also your vitamin D levels, right? So if you're low in vitamin D, that can actually cause your hair to fall out. Now, the problem is when you start adding all these vitamins in there, you may, it might, oh, I've got my hair back. You don't know which one it is. So what might be good is to like every two days, like, okay, add the, add more vitamin C. Next one, add this until you figure out which one it is. Um, okay. And then... Um, when you do fasting, just make sure that you're, um, you're supplementing a lot of the nutrients. I'd say 20, 30 years ago, someone could fast and they would not lose their hair because they just had more, the food 
was more nutrient dense nowadays. Um, it's just so, so empty. That's what we're up against. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then as your body becomes more efficient, I think you've been doing this for two years, so you must, um, you must have probably already really supported insulin resistance. So to the point where you probably don't have that anymore. An average person going into this, they have insulin resistance, which doesn't even allow them to absorb the nutrients that well. So they're getting a, they're taking nutrients, but it's not going in because of insulin resistance. So I think in your case, you've done it so long, I think you're going to be good. Um, but that's what I would do. And then you have the, you have vitamin D. You also have um, vitamin E, another important one. Um, the uh, and also um, the other other ones, omega three fatty acids. Um, okay. Olive oil is a good one because you have vitamin A, D, and then um, omega three fatty acids. So these are what just type... key, th key things I would do. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I was just was wondering what type of food would have like a lot of the vitamin. B complex because I find like it's usually foods that are high in carbs. Yeah, right. It's the yeah. grains. So yeah. um, uh, sunflower seeds um, are a really good source. Nutritional yeast and organ meats, liver. Okay. That, I'm sure you love that. <laughs> um, as far as the trace minerals go, um, oysters, shellfish, massive. Salmon, okay. really good for vitamins and minerals. Um, mm -hmm. For your potassium, magnesium, those are all the leafy greens. Okay. So um, that'll give you some idea on what you should be eating. But uh, yeah, I know it's hard to get the B vitamins. It really is, um, mm -hmm. especially. Well, I've food. also heard, I've also heard a lot about um, how women shouldn't fast too long because it affects their hormones. Is right. that something that I should be concerned about only, as well? It only, affects, it only affects the hormones um, if you're nutrient deficient, because they talk. There's the the research is done on low calorie diets, um, mm -hmm. and so it's really it's the nutrients, um, because they'll find that if a woman does keep, uh, fasting too long, it might show up in their thyroid. But really, what happens is the thyroid is adapting to um, this without food. And so it becomes more efficient. So mm -hmm. what doesn't change is the thyroid stimulating hormone, but T3 does decrease because your cells are more efficient. So it's not really a hypothyroid problem because the thyroid stimulating hormone stays the same. And so, um, and also talking about the thyroid, well, actually I'm going to hold off because that's one of the questions I think. Think. Let me just double check that. Yeah, so I'm going to hold off some of the questions. So, and I'll talk about the thyroid, but it's really about the nutrients and um, uh, making sure you have all the uh, the key nutrients for uh, female hormones. And women have more estrogen than men. That's the big thing. That, um, but honestly, fasting has so many benefits for women that um, it far outweighs any type of negative things with fasting. Well, that's great. And Don, make sure you stay tuned here so you can watch the question, maybe get more information useful to you and your family and so on. And speaking of questions, Dr. Berg, uh, let's go to the one that we first got answers. What, which nutrient deficiency is related to nausea during pregnancy? In our audience, 40% of them say B6, 35 say folic acid, and 25% say iron. Any winners? Yes, it's B6. B6. B6 is one of those, um, it's called a coenzyme. It, it actually, uh, it's a helper, helper um, thing for enzymes. And enzymes are those magical things in our bodies that do all the work, not just with digestion, but with chemistry and biochemistry and metabolism. So B6 is one of those things that um, it's in a lot of foods, but but a lot of women are deficient in B6, uh, probably 30 well, almost 30% of women are deficient in B6. So it's one of those factors that if you add B6, a lot of things clear up um, because it's involved in so many different chemical pathways. And so it's, um, it's kind of like um, it allows the enzymes to work better um, in metabolism, in um, pregnancy, building a baby, to uh, the breakdown of carbs, proteins, and fats. 
So B6 is, I, I will be releasing a video this next week on B6, but um, that's the one a lot of women are deficient in. If you're going through pregnancy, uh, you'll know it if you have nauseousness. Well, that's fantastic. And, and audience, be sure to stick around toward the end of the show, and Dr. Berg is going to go over all the great videos that he has coming up uh, for you and all those around the world. And let's not neglect social media. So let's start with Facebook. Terry from Facebook, can I drink non-dairy creamer with my coffee while fasting? Well, it depends what's in it, right? Uh, <laughs> these non-dairy creamers, sometimes they have so many chemicals. Um, just make sure they're keto-friendly and they're not you know, soy based, that type of thing. Um, some of them have some pretty nasty chemicals. Um, so I would have to look at the ingredients first. Um, but I personally do a, um, organic, um, heavy cream for my coffee. So that's what I do. Um, but you know, it has low amounts of, um, the casein and it's a uh, high fat. So, it seems to be fine. I'm just doing small amounts. And usually a small amount will not kick you out of ketosis. Okay, wonderful. Margo from YouTube, I hope she was listening because she's asking something similar to your discussion earlier. Is there a happy medium between low-carb dieting and carb loading? Well, Dr. Berg, answer that, and I just don't think you're going to get any great results from that. Um, so uh, let's check that off the list. Sasha from Facebook, what are your thoughts on fixing shin splints? I'm on your healthy keto plan. Boy, those are pain in the shin. You know, there's a really great technique. And what you want to do is you want to stretch the opposite muscle. So um, you for shin splints, you, you stretch your calf muscle, okay? Um, and so, um, and of course, if it's an overuse injury, of course, you, you just want to stop using it for a while. Um, a lot of nutrients support the repair of ligaments, muscles, and tendons. Um, I have a video on that. You can watch that. But I think the best thing to do is to just search Dr. Berg shin splints and watch the, um, the stretch that you can do for that. It works like magic. So check it out. And uh, if you have problems in your calves, you would stretch the, the, uh, the front part of the muscle because the shin is the front part of your lower leg. So you always think in opposites. Um, and you want to stretch the opposite muscle where you have pain or inflammation. Well, good luck to them. Let's see. Little B from YouTube. Will taking glucosamine worsen gallstones? Not to my knowledge. Um, glucosamine is good for uh, joints. It's also, um, it also is good for arrhythmias as well. But, um, I've not heard anything that can worsen the gallbladder. Um, what worsens the gallbladder is high levels of cortisol, stress, high levels of estrogen, and a low-fat diet because then you get this super concentrated, well, you actually you dry up your, um, your, um, your bile salts, so therefore then you have just cholesterol without the bile salts, and then you get the crystallization, and you get the gallstone. So adding more fat, um, will help reduce the risk of gallstones. Okay, here's a heartbreaker uh, from YouTube. Husson from YouTube is on IF, but weight is blowing up because of the medicines they're taking for MS, muscle, muscular sclerosis, I suppose. Anything uh, Husson can do? The, the worst thing about an autoimmune disease, uh, especially MS, is that the, the inflammation, if you can do anything about inflammation, you can really uh, reduce the symptoms and even the need for medication. Of course, check with your doctor before taking that recommendation. But um, the, the key pointer that I talk about in one of my videos with MS is large amounts of vitamin D, okay, D3. So you'd probably want to do 40,000 IUs. And fasting, a lot of fasting, that will drop your inflammation. And if you have less inflammation, then all of a sudden MS is not bothering your nerves as much anymore. So that way you can decrease the need for medication. But yes, you're right. The problem is like all these medications then throw off the body and then you, you don't feel good and you're bloated and you have all sorts of other issues. So um, I'm going to be do, releasing a very interesting video this next week on your 
an alkalization and acidification as far as your stomach in relationship to uh, enzymes. Um, enzymes tend to work in a very specific pH in your body. And so if your pH is off, enzymes won't work. And in fact, most of the drugs out there and most of the poisons work by inhibiting enzymes. So stay tuned for that very interesting video that uh, I will release next week. Can't wait, Doc. Let's go to our next question. Okay, what is the primary cause of liver transplants in the U.S.? So there's a number one reason why people are getting liver transplants in the U.S. And this reason is the second reason in the whole world, but the primary reason in the United States. So see if you guys can guess, out of all the things that will destroy your liver, take a while to guess what the number one thing is. And I'll tell you what, this it's a, surprise you. Yeah, it's a grim thing too. There's just not nearly enough livers to go around. Many people die, uh, you know, waiting on the list. So boy, the best way to do that is avoid wrecking yours. So let's get yeah. that question to us. And uh, Yvonne from Facebook, I have no thyroid and have gained 25 pounds since then. Is keto and IF lifestyle right for her, for Yvonne? It's, it's, it's really the, the best thing you could do because now we can leverage the fuel what type of fuel you use and um, you still have a pancreas. That means you still have insulin. So that's, that's the key hormone that you want to bring down that insulin, that insulin. So you can then tap into your fat. Unfortunately, with the thyroid, now we're missing a real big part of your metabolism. So you're going to have to leverage the other, other glands in a way to help you lose weight. So you're going to have to bring your carbs down even more. But out of all the things that can be extracted from your body, you can still live a comfortable, healthy life without a thyroid if you have someone that's really good that can monitor these thyroid hormones, make sure you 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 take in your thyroid hormones in, in the correct amounts. You maybe even want to find a doc that can work with you on more of the natural, um, like whole thyroid complexes, like they have Armour Thyroid. There's several others that you can use that have not just the T4, but you have T3, and some of the other hormones that the thyroid produces, like calcitonin. So there's a, there's a more to that than just taking Synthroid or a synthetic T4. And then you also have the conversion of that T4 to T3. So um, watch my videos on that to see if you can just enhance that with being on keto and intermittent fasting. All right, let's go back to our callers, so to speak. And we have got Carolina from Vancouver. And Carolina, if you'd unmute yourself, we're going to put you on with Dr. Berg. Go ahead with your question. Nice meeting you, Dr. Berg. And nice thank you, you so much for everything you, uh, you are doing. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I think I will have like two uh, short questions. Uh, we are on keto and intermittent fasting for three years. And one of the question is, uh, uh, we grown and uh, like when I was a child, we grown our own fruits in a garden and I don't have any cravings on, on keto. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when you are traveling in Thailand and there is like fresh mangoes or stuff like that, you want to try it out. So that's, that's the first question. And the second one that uh, I was lately watching a lot of documentaries about food. And also the documentary from uh, David Attenborough, which I really like. And everyone is talking about, you know, uh, reducing the meat and dairy consumption. And we actually tried out <laughs> for several months, but it doesn't work for me. So is there any recommendation or any information that would help me to do not feel guilty about my impact on the environment with eating especially meat because I don't eat much dairy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's an interesting question there. I think, um, I think there's some really some good arguments that um, uh, if you're consuming wild caught, I'm sorry, not wild caught grass fed meats from, from animals that have been treated very, very uh, fairly and in a healthy way that um, that support that greatly and that's what i do so like u.s wellness meats i mean they're feeding these uh cattle which also produce the cheese and the milk and the creams uh and the dairy um very very well i mean these 
So I think there's um, pros and cons, and I, I think that um, that's as far as I'm going to go with that answer <laughs> without getting myself okay. in trouble. Yeah. But I will say that um, the first question you asked, maybe you need to repeat that because I... Uh, the first question was uh, that I don't have any cravings, but when I travel or where is the season, oh, you know, right, right. I want okay. to try fruit. <laughs> well, yeah. Have some. You know, you've been doing it for two years so it sounds like you're pretty consistent if you're if you get your body in a in a power state so you're you're in a higher level of health where everything's working and you're feeling great and you don't have a lot of problems i don't think there's any problem with doing you know occasionally you go off and you have mangoes especially like mangoes that are good um or peaches that are good occasionally so you're not making a habit of it but the, the these um I don't know what's where that background music's coming from. Um, so I think that um, if you, like even mangoes, for example, you have all this carbohydrate, but you also have a lot of vitamins and minerals that will prevent the, um, the complications of the high sugar. And that's that's the good thing about fruit is that, especially what you you would eat, it's like you're getting a lot of vitamins with that. There are nutri like great nutrients and phytonutrients in fruit. The problem is the, the carbs. Um, when I try to do apples, for example, and peanut butter, oh, yeah, there's vitamins in apples, but there's like 20, 21 grams of sugar in one apple. And I went up to 100, 211 pounds. My face went round. And so I'm like, okay, so... Yeah, the fruit has vitamins, but it has too many carbs. So, uh, of course, I was doing it on a regular basis. So I think um, sparingly would be a good answer. Um, so you're not like, you know, and then see how you feel. But um, yes. especially like I'm sure it's seasonal that, I mean, it's hard to resist if you're traveling from a country that has these mangoes. I, I was traveling through some island a while ago, and I never in my life saw a um, – um, what was it? Uh, cashews growing on a tree. And there's a fruit with this cashew. Was and I had to try it for experimental reasons, of course. And uh, that fruit was the best fruit I ever had in my life. I couldn't even describe it. It was wild tasting. So, um, cashew fruit. Go figure. Well, that's fantastic. Well, Carolina, thank you so much for joining us on Doctor Berg's show. Why don't we go to the answers for our second quiz question and. Uh, you asked the audience, what's the primary cause of liver transplants in the U.S.? And 68% uh, say uh, sugar, high carbs. 20% say insulin resistance. And, uh, well, 12% say cirrhosis, but I suspect that's uh, what occurs at the end stage. You're gonna, this might surprise you. It's acetaminophen, like other, known as Tylenol. Oh, wow. Toxicity. Tylenol. Now, you might say, well, how can that be? Well... Acetaminophen is in NyQuil. It's in like hundreds of products all over the place. So people don't even know they're getting it. DayQuil, NyQuil, it's in a lot of different um, things. I'm going to do a video on this. but um, um, And you don't need that much. You need like like 4,000 milligrams or 4 grams to have a, you know irreversible damage to your liver. And if you have liver problems, like let's say you have a fatty liver or cirrhosis or hepatitis or you're a smoker or you're a drinker or you you do a lot of diet sodas with aspartame, right? Now your, your limit, it goes down to three grams per day. So if you're doing that, that could be enough to create a death of your liver cells and now you're on the transplant list. So um, this is just fascinating just to increase the awareness of what that chemical can do and how many people have a problem with it. So again, definitely watch that video because it's important, especially if you take, take it. And I, I've given you solutions too in that video of what you can do to protect the liver. So you, so if you have to take it, you can at least minimize the damage because it's going to act like a poison at a certain amount. Boy, that's scary stuff, doc. Uh, Carla from Facebook, she's a RN, uh, how come my scale is not moving on keto IF, but my clothes are looser? What's going on? It sounds like something good's going on. What happens when you get healthy is that your 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 muscles start to repair. Muscles, if compared to fat per volume, um, have more of a weight. 
And so um, a lot of people get their muscles back, especially if they're menopausal, because you have those, all this atrophy. So we're getting muscle back. It's healthy. You're healing. Uh, the healing process takes time. And uh, so it's working. Don't give up. Just keep going. And then there will be a point where you'll start to um, lose the fat. But also realize that I, I have a lot of videos on plateau, and those are the ones that you should watch. What you should do if you want to bust through this plateau. Um, the most important thing you need to know is um, to fix insulin resistance because that's what's behind that slow, stuck set point that you can't seem to get down past this uh, weight. Um, so that's what you need to focus on and also research. Well, I'll tell you what, Jackie, you shook her up on Facebook, said, OMG, I went off Tylenol in June and my liver enzymes have improved. So thank goodness for her. You stay, uh, you know, keep an eye on that, Jackie. That's some serious stuff for sure. Okay, let's look here. So, um, okay, we got the answers. VJ from Facebook, what is the best way to lower my uh, systolic blood pressure? What's that all about, Doc? That's the top number. And then you have the bottom number, which is the diastolic. The um, systolic tends to go up when the adrenals are stressed more than anything because it's the, uh, it's the sympathetic nervous system that contracts it, and then you have the parasympathetic that relaxes it. So um, the key is supporting the adrenals and cortisol. And uh, one real simple way, just um, especially these people always have sleeping problems, take, take some vitamin D. Uh, three before bed with some vitamin B5. Those are two things that will help reduce cortisol. And there's many more. And you can watch my video on cortisol. Vitamin D is key, though, and that should start to reduce blood pressure. Now, the other thing about blood pressure is that um, vitamin D, there seems to be a direct one-to-one -one ratio. Um, if you're deficient in D, your blood pressure goes up. If you take too much D, you end up with low blood pressure. So vitamin D is a great way to lower blood pressure. Um, don't forget about that. That's terrific. I tell you what, a recurring question, and I think it's an important one, at this time on YouTube, Jackie wants to know if it's okay for her 15-year-old nephew to embark on uh, intermittent fasting. I think she said keto too, but what about young people, Doc? It's a judgment call. Uh, there's a lot of younger people that are overweight, and in that case, the key is making sure they get the right nutrients. So make sure the food that they eat is nutrient dense. Make sure that they're taking supplements while they're fasting. But I mean, think about this. I mean, how many teenagers or young kids are doing a nutrient dense diet? I mean, they're just they're they're eating a lot of food, but they're so nutritionally deficient. It's crazy. So um, it's all about nutrition. And um, but I wouldn't do any long term fasting because. Um, for if you're a small child or anything like that, because that can affect um, your nutrient levels and that can affect your growth, things like that. So um, the main thing is the snacking. Make sure these kids don't snack so much because that's really the killer right now with um, so many kids that are overweight and right. adults, Steve. Yeah. I won't mention any names. No kidding. Absolutely. Well, I'm a, I'm in the Petri dish uh, with Dr. Burke. He's always sort of poking at me and wondering what possesses me to do the things I do, especially with all his good counsel. But I'm a work in progress, and I do love intermittent fasting. And Anna from YouTube uh, is watching your videos, and she said that you mentioned uh, in one of your videos that COVID patients are suffering a vitamin D, excuse me, vitamin C deficiency. Can you expand on that concept for Anna? There was a recent study done on it. I, I uh, did a video on it that um, a very large percentage of uh, COVID patients, especially in the um, hospitals, the severe cases, very deficient in vitamin C. So vitamin C is an antioxidant. It, um, it keeps the um, immune system supported. And um, I have a free course on the immune system. If you guys haven't taken it, um, you can, it's in, should be in some of the links in my videos, but that's a, it's a great course. I talk about um, the relationship between what these vitamins do and, and what it does to your immune system. It's good, good training and also understanding so then you can avoid having the complications and ending up in uh, a severe situation, regardless of what you get infection-wise.
Well, I tell you what, early on in this whole COVID thing, I remember you saying, Steve, you got to do the vitamin D and you got to do zinc and this, that, and the other. And then months later, suddenly the airways were live from CDC and stuff. Make sure you take vitamin D and zinc. So, uh, so impressed with your uh, prescriptive, I guess I shouldn't say that word, but your uh, recommendations on that because it sure lit up around the uh, globe after what became obvious to you became science to the rest of them. So I think that's terrific. Uh, let's see, how about Yuri from YouTube wants to know if you can address the impact of OMAD on menstrual cycles? Um, <laughs> a lot of women who start um, uh, start OMAD and do fasting, their cycles start to go back in rhythm, and they even kick in there when they, they were kind of like gone after a while. Um, so, But and occasionally they, they, there's a problem, and uh, they might go away because you're going through this adjustment because the body um, is not used to it. And uh, when you start to change, especially foods, um, you might get this adaptation mechanism. One really good thing to reset the relationship between your pituitary and your ovaries is to take inositol. Inositol is a really good um, nutrient to coordinate between your ovaries and your pituitary, that whole feedback loop. Uh, another one that is really good is royal jelly uh, from bees. That's a good remedy to support infertility and a lot of problems with the ovaries. So if you have problems with your ovaries, including PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, royal jelly is a good thing to um, take. That's terrific. Dr. Berg, have another question. All right. What is the primary remedy for age-related muscle loss as you get older um there's a situation where you start losing muscle mass um what's the best thing you can do out of all the things i'm going to be releasing a video this week and but i want to talk about the number one thing so what do you think that could be interesting well i tell you what let's hear from uh uh claudia uh, claudia if you'd unmute yourself i'd like you to ask a question of dr burton Hello, Dr. Berg. Thank you for having me. Hi, absolutely. Yes. So um, mine's a little complicated because I've, I've dealt with so much health issues. Um, I'm doing the keto and the intermediate fasting for my health, not to lose weight. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis uh, when I was 13 years old. Um, got to a point where, you know, it gave me kidney failure uh, doctors are trying to put me, <clears throat> sorry, on a kidney transplant list. But since I've had such high blood pressure for so long due to my kidney failure, uh, now they're saying that my heart is also weak and not able to go ahead with, uh, you know, any surgery. So I'm, I started doing this now for like two weeks. And honestly, it's the only thing I feel a difference on. And so I'm excited and you know, I just have some questions like, uh, would it like lower my blood pressure? You know, I've continued doing this. So also like the potassium phosphorus thing. I know that I can't always have all the vegetables due to my condition. Um, are you stage five uh, kidney failure or are you on dialysis, anything like that? Or what stage are yeah, you? Yeah, I am, I am on dialysis right now, yes. But I have still some function, just not the virus. Okay. Yeah, this is a, it's kind of a delicate situation because you have to really work yeah. with a good doctor to see what foods you have to avoid or what minerals you have to avoid or vitamins you have to avoid. So you're, you're stuck a little bit between a rock and a hard place. But here's the thing. There is some recent data. I'll see if I could release that video this next week because I, I, I just, I did it like a month ago. I didn't never release it yet, but it, some new data on the um, on potassium in the kidneys. So even if someone does have um, stage five and they're on dialysis, apparently if they mm -hmm. get their potassium from certain foods and they're not taking it as a supplement, it seems to be helpful to the kidney, which is fascinating because this is like exactly opposite of what was been told. And you'll have to get that research and give it to your doctor. Um, I think what yeah. you're, what's going to benefit you um, is to really find out um, how what you have to avoid and try to do the best you can with um, with your your foods and make sure that um, 
you don't consume any foods that have any chemicals whatsoever, which I'm sure you're doing completely organic. Mm -hmm. um, wild yes. thing. And then the other thing too is um, fasting is going to be your most important thing that's going to help you. Now, I did have a guy come to my office. He was on dialysis. He was a veterinarian. And um, he apparently didn't need dialysis anymore after after seeing me for, for a bit. Now, um, I haven't seen him in some years, and I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, but one thing that I did recommend to him, and it seemed to be very beneficial, is to do the manual therapy. And what do I mean by that? It's acupressure therapy on his kidneys directly. And um, there's some videos on um, that I might have done on that, if I'm not mistaken, and they're the same acupressure points as the adrenals. So you may want to just do that, and uh, it may help um, in some way to help your kidneys become more filtered. Um, so these are just little things that I think I would focus on right now, and of course, keeping your stress very low and um, doing mild exercise and and just tweaking your foods to make sure that they're really clean, and then uh, hopefully your body will bounce back. And with the fasting, you go through autophagy which you can then now start to take some of the damaged kidney and recycle some of the tissues and start forming new kidney cells. There's some other data too on stem cell therapy that you might want to look at, but um, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a juggle and um, not big changes, small changes over a period of time. Well, I tell you what, we're sure pulling for you, Claudia. Steve, Steve I just want to get this last comment from what what was that claudia oh wow go ahead there we go let's hang on just a moment uh claudia you're back with us go ahead with that comment claudia yeah I'm, i was saying that i was able to um come off dialysis multiple times in the past um it's just the past two years has been the hardest for me to jump on jump back on my health uh, but this is the only thing that now I see the difference that is getting better. And I am, I'm having hope that this is the right way because I never fasted for this long or ate this right. And my key point now is just to, I guess, try to control the blood pressure so my heart can get stronger. And I know that by fasting, you can, you know, like you said, operate and get some stem cells and get that, those tissues uh, regrowing and stuff. Absolutely. Uh, I think you're on the right track um, and, because because potassium. And vitamin D, I, I got some from, from you. Like uh, I bought some vitamin D and and the vitamin E. Is that good as well? Like good quality yes. vitamin E? Get, get, get the one that has only tocotrienols. That's the best mm -hmm. vitamin yeah, E. Yeah, that's what I did. And, and that will actually protect the, um, the breakdown uh, from lupus and the inflammation that is creating high levels of oxidation to your tissues. So yeah, you want, you want high levels of um, antioxidants and your body will make, make your own antioxidants from the fasting too. So um, I think you're onto something and I think um, I'll be curious like in six months, how you're doing. I think you'll do, you'll do quite well. Well, that's okay. wonderful. Amazing. Well, Claudia, we're uh, sure rooting for you. The whole world is, and we'd love to hear back from you with your uh, progress on your special challenges there. So uh, Dr. Berg, why don't we answer another quiz question? So uh, it was, what is, or no, let's ask it. Go ahead, Dr. Berg. All right, uh, what's the primary remedy for age-related muscle weak, uh, loss? Did you actually get the answers yet? Because we already asked that, Steve. Oh, that's right, we certainly did. And it is 70% say high intensity exercise and 30% say weight training. Uh, that sounds like some solid answers. They're both right. Um, it's resistant exercise. Exercise, number one, um, let's hands down, number one, it's, it's the number one thing you could do to um, slow that down. It's a potent way to um, slow down the atrophy of the muscles versus anything else but in the video i'm going to talk about some other things as well so you have the complete picture but sooner or later you know we all go through this where we uh, get to a certain age where our muscles start to waste away and and then that affects a whole bunch of other issues and so um there are way things that you can do consistent exercise to postpone that event as much as possible i would highly recommend it 
Wonderful. Okay, let's kick off the next question, and then we're going to go to uh, Christina. And here we go, Doc. All right. What is the primary vitamin that boosts progesterone? If you're watching and you're going through uh, menopause, menopause, you need to know this. Okay. All right. That's out there with them. And then let's go to Christina. And Christina, I'll have you unmute yourself and go on with Dr. Bird. Hi. Hi. So I um, I'm 52. I'm a vegetarian, but I found out that um, recently I had hyperparathyroidism. They sent me straight to a surgeon. Um, end of June, I had a tumor removed, and uh, I had severe bone pain for two years. Didn't know what it was. Um, now they want to remove my gallbladder. It's completely full of gallstones. I um, I can't find anything out there on remedies for a completely full gallbladder. Now, I don't have any issues with bile. All my labs are showing normal now, but I'm still having a lot of um, bone pain, hot flashes, and I have a little bit of fatty liver. Um, I've been a vegetarian for a year and a half. I've been happy with it, and um, um, my daughter and I both, she does cross-country. Um, both of our lab tests are great um, now, but I'm still having these symptoms, so I got it. what do you suggest? So um, so I have a question for you. Um, you probably have been on a, a low saturated fat diet, right? A low animal fat diet for a long time, right? Um, I eat a lot of eggs um, okay. most okay. daily. Yeah. Okay. So the um, antidote to gallstones, the, the, the actual cause and the cause, the cause is lack of bile salts. The antidote is bile salts, so you need bile salts. Now, I, I don't know if you're beyond the point of no return as far as if you could shrink those gallstones if it's completely filled. I don't know. Maybe there's a procedure that they can keep the gallbladder and just take the stones out and sew it back up. I don't know. Um, but um, based on your symptoms, uh, it sounds like you are lacking bile salts, and bile salts also help you absorb the fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, which is essential for so many other conditions. Um, so it sounds to me, especially if you have a you had a parathyroid tumor, which you did you did you just have one tumor they took out, so you have three other parathyroids? That's correct. It was a very large tumor. They thought I had it for ten years, you know, it, it was over two centimeters. Wow. Well, good thing you have three left. Good thing you have spares. Um, but the parathyroid regulates calcium, and also it's highly um, related to vitamin D. So I think there's something missing here, and I think um, you need to um, – did your doctor tell you to take any vitamin D now or not? I'm getting different recommendations um, from between the surgeon, endocrinologist, par you know, regular doctor. Um some are saying don't take calcium. Some are saying do take calcium. I am taking the vitamin D and K. Um, I am. I feel like when, when I try to go off the calcium, I get vibrations and pain still. So I do a lot better while I'm taking the calcium. Um, I, was, I did have a surgery scheduled for the gall, gallbladder to be removed. And um, I'm not having pain with it at all. I just get some uh, bloating after I eat. Um, Got it. So, um, well, one reason that you could be have a problem with calcium is uh, vitamin D helps you absorb calcium by a factor of 20 times in the small intestine. So let's say because you don't have enough bile, you're not absorbing vitamin D, your calcium absorption will be really down too. And then the feedback goes up to the parathyroid. And it's like, wait a second. Oh, we have to produce more parathyroid to regulate this and that. So... Um, I think the best solution for you is to get some purified bile salts and um, the gallbladder formula just to start taking that. And probably even between meals, get a get something called Tudka, T-U-D-C-A, Tudka, and take uh, one in the morning on an empty stomach and one in the afternoon on an empty stomach in addition to bile salts during the meal. And that way you'll have enough bile salts to not just support 
the gallbladder and the bile and for digestion, but you'll also have enough to help you absorb more vitamin D, which will then help regulate your calcium levels to the optimum level. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of other functions that are uh, will go back into place once you have every your chemistry back to normal as well. But I think what you're missing is this, this bile salt. And that does happen with vegetarians because they tend to go lower on the fat than meat eaters. And fat is the saturated fat is the thing that stimulates the bile release. You can still do it as a as a vegetarian, but it's just more difficult, and you have to know what you're doing. So, uh, I think that's what I would do if I were you. Okay, and then the only question I would have would be the calcium. How much you would recommend at this point, since I am still having the pain and vibrations and the hot flashes. So, calcium orotate is a good one, um, and I would just really juggle it. Make sure you don't take enough. Just take a little bit and then keep increasing it until those symptoms go away. Because calcium is a is a is one mineral that tends to be retained in the body more than other minerals. Um, and maybe if you have some high quality European cheese, that might be good too. Uh, well, if you can do it as a vegetarian. But um, the thing is that I think that that would be a good source as well. Uh, you. <laughs> I don't know if you can do sardines. That's a good source of calcium too. Um, but if not, do that calcium orotate and uh, don't don't go crazy with it, but just increase it till those symptoms disappear. That's wonderful. Christina, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate that. Now let's get some answers to our uh, last quiz question here. What's the primary vitamin that boosts uh, progesterone? Excuse me. And uh, six, or excuse me, sixty-five percent say vitamin E, twenty percent say magnesium, and twenty percent say vitamin D. The answer is vitamin B six again. Interesting, B six. Oh. Yeah, that's well, the one. We didn't get for, men, it. for women that are going through menopause. Very important vitamin. Isn't that interesting? Okay, well, as promised, we've got a list of things coming up for uh, your audience, Doctor Berg. Why don't you go over these great videos that are around uh, the corner? Key foods for Parkinson's disease, we'll talk about uh, consuming too much zinc can cause a copper deficiency, and I list out all those symptoms. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking about coffee and how coffee can actually lower certain diseases in your body, which is pretty good. Uh, the number one most addictive food. Um, and um, also, um, we're going to talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, we're going to talk about the thyroid we're going to talk about why you should acidify versus alkalize the body and the importance of the pH with enzymes. So these are all really um, interesting topics. I think you'll like them. And, um, and I want to say one thing to Jessica. I heard that you're a psychiatrist. There's quite a few psychiatrists now that are using keto and intermittent fasting with their patients because of the amazing effect on changing the cognitive and mood function. You might want to study some of the other doctors out there that are doing that. I think you may find that very beneficial. On that note, have a wonderful week, everyone. I appreciate everyone being here and your attention and the great comments. Uh, I will see you next week. Um, stay tuned.